Hello, everyone, and welcome to this 40 Days Live event. My name is Adele Halliday, and I serve at the National Office of the United Church of Canada as the Anti-Racism and Equity Lead Staff. And it's a pleasure that you are here. Uh, this evening, we'll have some time to explore uh, raising anti-racist children with Heather Beamish and Mary Nicole, and they'll introduce themselves a bit more fully in a moment. But uh, first, just a few opening words. One is just to note that uh, this, of course, is part of the 40 days of engagement on anti-racism. Um, we're in the middle of week three at the moment, and there's lots happening. Um, this week, there are several featured writers uh, who, are, who have offered written reflections that represent some of the breadth of diversity across the church. They're all available online. Um, we're gathered for this event, which will be recorded and available for a video as a video afterwards, so it can be shared and reshared. There's also a featured book of the week. It's available from the United Church Bookstore, and it's called How to Raise an Anti-Racist. It's a perfect accompaniment to this evening's um, uh, exploration of raising anti-racist children. And uh, if you chose to order this book or any any two books, um, you would receive a discount of 20% if you use the discount, uh, the code 40 days. So it's on ucrdstore.ca. So this and much more are all available on the 40 days website, and I'll put the link in the chat in a moment. Uh, that's a great place to start exploration of signing up for the newsletter, finding all of these, um, finding the rest of the live events and finding all the written reflections and more. So thank you once again for being here. So with that, um, I will turn it over to Mary and um, Heather to introduce themselves and guide us to the rest of the evening. It's gonna be an exciting evening. Um, for everyone who's here, we would invite you, if you have questions to please put them in the chat. Uh, we'll have some time for question and answers at, at closer to the end of the gathering. Um, so please feel free to ask questions at any time and we'll pick those up and respond. So. Heather and Mary. So great to be with you. Um, so Heather and I chatted about how to, um, how this evening will look. And I was going to start with sharing who I am and a bit about my um, personal journey. And so my name is Mary Nichol. My pronouns are she, her. I am a white third generation um, born in Canada. And my ancestors come from Ukraine, Italy, and Wales. I live and work on the unceded and traditional land of the Semiamu, Kwatlen, and Kitsi First Nations. I give thanks to be on this land and commit to living and to care for and respect with creation. I currently serve as Pacific Mountain uh, Regional Councillor uh, in Pacific Mountain Regional Council as Regional Minister for First Third Ministry. And First Third Ministry are those in the first third of life. I spend uh, much of my time in supporting, connecting, and equipping leaders, as well as supporting camping ministry. I am the mother of two daughters who are 22 and 24 years old, and I volunteer at Children's Church at Crossroads United in Delta. And in the spring of 2021, uh, just to go into a bit about my um, journey in um, anti-racism work, uh, in the spring of 2021, I attended a session uh, talking with children about race at the Children's Spirituality Summit. And up until then, I had been reading and learning on my own regarding um, my own white privilege and racial, racial justice. And this one hour session uh, led by Anthony Peterson led me into space and action that I hadn't quite entered into before. And Anthony, um, in the one bit too short of an hour session. Uh, I continued to, I reached out to Anthony and he reached out to me and we continued to work together in a couple of uh, different leadership ventures. And last year, um, we, I was a part of a cohort uh, for a week long course on spirituality of race for children and youth. And as a white woman and a white parent and a white leader in the church, I've uh, learned some important pieces, uh, very important pieces that are holding up I'm holding up in my journey, um, and in particular, raising anti-racist children. So first, um, it's been uh, quite a journey to get in touch with my own race story and recalling times for when I was a child 
a teenager, a young adult, where I was aware of race and spoke about race or didn't. And so I've learned how important, one of the most important things, especially in that first engagement two years ago, was how important it is in raising children to be anti-racist to talk about race with children early and often. And then as a white woman, um, how comfortable um, getting into comfort zone of, of what that means and discomfort. And so in my journey of reading and reflection, um, I've was reading Raising White Children by Jennifer Henry. And uh, in that, uh, learning about the colorblindness that I wasn't aware of when I was young, and in particular when my girls were little, I had conversations with them at the time uh, two years ago, asking them, you know, what did we talk about regarding race? I remember being aware when my daughter was, my first daughter was born about um, re- Uh, books and toys in our home and in social media that were uh, mainly representing white. And so I tried to integrate toys and books, um, but we didn't really talk um, in our journey, my journey as a parent about race and skin color. And so that really came really forefront for me, um, the vital importance about talking about race with children early and often. And a couple of other things that started to come up for me was, um, learning about how whiteness is hidden and that my job as a white person to uncover the whiteness to name to name it. And so two um, important lines uh, in my journey uh, in the last couple of years have been uh, one line that Ibram X. Kendi writes in How to Raise an Anti-Racist is uh, there's nothing, it's an anti-racist thought. There's nothing right about me because of the color of my skin. And Ibram writes, there's nothing right about me because of the color of my skin. This is an anti-racist idea that all white children need to be taught, internalized, and develop their sense through. White children need protection from all the verbal and nonverbal messages telling them that they are special because they're white. And Ibrahim goes on and to say there is nothing wrong. The other anti-racist idea is there is nothing wrong with me because of the color of my skin. And imagine if children of color are taught this anti-racist idea, internalize it, and develop their sense of self through it, and that children of color must be protected from the verbal and nonverbal messages telling them that they're not special because they're not white. So those um, talking about race early and often and uh, these ideas that are all around us, uh, racism, as a white parent, I've uh, started to collect and leader, collect some tools and I can share them in the link later, but some of some fantastic resources that I've learned about and starting to use um, both in my work and home is this one, uh, it's called a book, story. Stories are a great way to get into um, race with children and God's Holy Darkness by Sherry Green and Becca Selnick, an amazing resource. And the other one, um, Good Night Racism by Ibram X. Kendi. So one of the actions in all of that I've been learning is actions. What can we start to do in particular um, in our communities of faith? And so taking a look at the resources, the toys, the Bible stories that are there and doing an audit and and incorporating um, books about race that helps uh, facilitate conversations. Uh, One other point, and I, it just came to my desk as a resource before I finish my time and hand it over to Heather, is this new one called, it's called the Peace Table. And it's a Bible storybook. I just got it on my uh, desk, actually, when I um, earlier today. And I just want to note uh, the pictures uh, are amazing. And But I wanted to just um, reflect and share with you what they write about images. Uh, in this particular Bible storybook. Jesus has intentionally been depicted with a variety of appearances in this book. And in the faces of Jesus, Reverend Frederick Buckner explores how a diversity of representations helps a diversity of people to understand the significance of Jesus's incarnation. Jesus was born a Jewish child in a Middle Eastern family, so some illustrations show him with that appearance. But Jesus also transcends race and culture and God is God incarnate, God with us. 
for all people in all places and all times. So it is our prayer that when children see these varied representations of Jesus, they will more easily recognize the image of God within themselves and each other. So just um, this is an illustration to start to look at what resources are around and what um, storybooks are around in both homes and in communities of faith. Uh, just a little portion of my journey uh, to share with you this evening to get us started. I would love to turn it over to Heather. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Mary. I really appreciate you sharing your story and journey with us, the journey of growth and learning. I feel like that's one that um, I'm excited to talk to a little bit more tonight. Um, I'm just honestly sitting in a lot of gratitude right now for being able to be here with all of you to be able to share this space um, tonight. I know that gathering around a topic like this is sacred. It's sacred because in this room tonight, there is a desire, a desire for growth, a desire for learning, a desire to lean into equity in a greater degree. That's why you're here. That's why we're here. And that makes me really excited. That makes me really excited about what we're doing together as a community, as Canadians, as a body of faith. And so I just want to honor, I just want to start and open the room by honoring your energy and your commitment to this practice of uh, learning what it means to step up and step into allyship in greater degrees so that collectively we can flourish and thrive together. Yeah, I'm really excited about that. I want to just um, also say a huge, huge thank you to Adele. Um, Adele is championing this work at the head office of the United Church of Canada and getting to work with her on this project was such a delight. I just got to hear more about her passion for the work that she's doing and it was so great to be able to learn her story and her journey with within the United Church community. Um, hearing that she's been part of different churches and communities within the United Church for, for years. And so, um, yeah, it, I just feel like the relationship that we were able to build through this project and getting to see inside um, the vision and dedication she has to the important work of anti-racism and community flourishing, it it's beautiful. And I love the annual deep dive the United Church takes to energetically confront the roots of racism within the institution and plant new seeds of unity, equity, and possibility within the hearts of our community members. And so I love, I love that we're gathering around these uh, pillars and that energy tonight. So uh, once again, thank you. Uh, my name is Heather. My pronouns are she and her. And I am coming to you from uh, Toronto, where my beautiful wife and I live, love, and organize. And I am an, an author, an artist, and a speaker. And I've been facilitating conversations around the important topics of inclusion, faith, equity and diversity for almost 15 years now. And one thing that I think is really fun about, um, specifically about the intersections that I kind of carry when it comes to art and facilitation and workshops and teaching and training is that my art helps me keep grounded and um, connected to the conversations of equity because my art invites me to be embodied and ask myself how does this situation how does this information make me feel 
How does it interact with my physical body? What What's the wisdom of my body telling me in this? And so I just love how each of them feed into one another. And so tonight, just in the time that I have with all of you, I want to invite you into a poetic conversation. So because I'm an artist, I I love spoken word poetry and poetry in itself is just my favorite um, medium. And so tonight I want to weave some poetry into our conversation. Um, when I say we're going to have a poetic conversation, I just mean that the pace is going to be a little slower. You know, we're not going to rush through the moments of pause. I really want to invite you to reflect with the, with me as we engage together with this content. I don't want to talk at you. I want us to feel it together and let the wisdom bubbling up in our gathering speak to us. Allow us to think out of the box when it comes to applying this content to our context, our communities, for us to consider what it looks like for us to tangibly live into these principles tonight. So I'm going to talk us through um, uh, some tenets around allyship, which I'm really excited about because um, the energy of allyship is what is woven into the texts and the pages of the I am a change maker content and I love it because I think that allyship is the physical embodiment of love. And as people of faith, we've been invited into a life of love, into a cultivation of love. And so allyship being the embodiment, the essence of love, I'm so excited to be able to talk about where the I am the change maker content was birthed out of. So this is a new curriculum for those who don't know what this is. This is a brand new curriculum that the United Church of Canada is releasing as a resource to their churches, to the parents, to the community members, so that our communities will have language, will have tools, will be able to engage with dialogue, meaningful dialogue around the important tenets of allyship, equity, and inclusion. And this gets me really excited because one of the things that we that uh, Mary was talking about in her session is that it's so important that we start to have these conversations around equity and race soon early and often early and often is what is what the tenant is and so having this resource in our toolkit to be able to help our our sunday school teachers and our parents and our community members as a whole talk about and engage with the important conversation of racial equity is just exciting to be honest this content is um is very like it's one of a kind in the church curriculum atmosphere. I was actually a, a children's pastor in uh, Pentecostal and evangelical churches for many years. And um, it was hard to find tools and resources to have these important conversations with my students. You know, as a person of color um, and a queer woman and someone who cares a lot about justice, I was interested in finding tools and resources to be able to share with my students and community. And at the time, there wasn't, there wasn't any. And so the fact that it's exciting that the United Church has had that foresight to be able to dream up this resource for our churches and our communities. And that gets me really excited. And that is a nod to the work that Adele, Mary, and Ren and the team over there are doing at the head office. And so I'm 
I am just, yeah, I'm really excited about where, um, how things are shaping up at, at the office. And so that's great. So I want to talk a little bit with you about where the I am a change maker content was birthed out of, you know, the whole time when I was dreaming and researching and writing the curriculum, I kept on circling back to my main motivation behind creating the content. And my main motivation, that thing that just kept, I kept on circling back to, that was my, my goal that I was just trying to accomplish while writing the content was I want to equip the reader with tools for liberation so that, and so that they feel empowered to do the work of love, to embody the energy of love in their communities, in their lives, in their friendships, in their relationships. The whole purpose was liberation and empowerment, liberation and empowerment. And so ensuring that the tenets and the truths of equity, the principles of equity were woven into the lessons and into the intention behind the content. Um, I'm so thankful to have scripture and Bible verse and um, to be able to anchor those. So there's this content is theologically grounded. It's full of scriptures and stories and examples uh, uh, from the Bible of people who lived into love, who stood up for what they believed in. And honestly, one of my favorite, um, my favorite in the Bible uh, example who did that is Jesus. You know, the way that Jesus lived and embodied love and highlighted the core essentials of Christianity and showed up in his communities and within conversations uh, that he had, it's allyship on display. It's racial equity embodied. Jesus was the first change maker. Jesus is our example and continues to be our example. And so in this curriculum, we continue to point back to his example. We continue to point back to how we can better show up and be little Christians, Christians, right? And so I'm really excited about that. And to help highlight a little bit more of that, I'm just going to play a quick video that shows let me get out of this right here i'm going to play a quick video for you oopsie there we go perfect <laughs> i love that you're all watching me navigate this i'm like doo -doo -doo. <laughs> um but in this video here it's a video that we created for the curriculum, for the I Am a Changemaker curriculum. And um, uh, as a spoken word poet, I was able to weave some of my poems and stories into the content. And I wrote unique custom pieces that spoke to the tenants that the curriculum talks about. Um, and so this piece is a piece uh, from one of the lessons, and it's one that talks about allyship, and I'm excited to share it with you. So let's go ahead and play that. Jesus traded his comfort and status so that no one would be left out. He spoke the truth about what mattered to God so that there was no doubt. He came to earth and embodied how perfect love would interact with our humanity. His commitment to courage and kindness highlighted the core essentials for Christianity. He was tough and tender, nurturing and bold. He spoke truth to power and accepted everyone into his fold. No one's problems ever made him uncomfortable or nervous. He advocated for what he cared for. It was never just lip service. He didn't live for his friend's approval. 
He was a risk taker. He was guided by love and full of hope. That's what made him a change maker. There it is, Jesus, the OG ally, <laughs> the original ally that showcased for us, to us, what allyship looks like. I love that. So let's talk a little bit more tonight. I want to really, I'm really excited that we're gathered here and in this learning space during the 40 days of um of anti-racism work. And so tonight, I really want to practically give you some tools that you can leave here feeling excited about. Tonight, I want to deep dive into the tenets of allyship and just pull out a few simple truths that we, if we walk out, live out, embody, we can show up as better allies to communities of need, to racialized communities, to our queer siblings, to anybody who we notice the tentacles of oppression coming into their life. And so what is allyship? In its most basic form, it's the relational commitment to journey alongside marginalized communities until they can access the dignity and power that is the birthright of all humans. I love that. I love that. A relational commitment. There right there is some is, is a little bit of a tell of where we're going with what allyship looks like. Because that's exactly it. Allyship looks like something. Being an ally has an expression. It, it looks like something. It can be felt it can be traced back. It can be witnessed by other people. It's not just a nice feeling. It's the practice of making space and building bigger tables. It's the practice of making space and building bigger tables. We're talking about tables of inclusion, tables of belonging, recognizing and looking around our communities and asking ourselves, who's missing from our table? And I wonder what kind of systems are in place that are preventing those communities from feeling like they can engage with and access belonging in our space. Because if people aren't showing up, there's usually a reason. And so allyship invites us to slow down. Allyship invites us to step back and engage in that journey of committed relational equity embodying. And it is the tangible byproduct of an individual and an organization, a faith community, your Bible study, your family committing to this. It's the byproduct of a committed group embodying the worldview that's rooted in gratitude, a worldview that's rooted in mutuality and the belief in collective flourishing. Essentially, an ally is a change maker. It's a change maker. So, if we understand that allyship is a verb, then these three P's of allyship will help us deepen our commitment to this restorative posture. So allyship is a practice, allyship is personal, and allyship is practical. <laughs> I really like the three P's even for myself. I feel like that's a great way. It helps me to remember. And I like the alliteration of it all. <laughs> but let's first break this down. So what does it mean for allyship to be a practice? Well, just like any other skill that we have and we develop and we nurture in our lives, our effectiveness and proficiency 
when it comes to that particular skill, it develops over time. You know, as much as I like to play basketball, I have to admit that I didn't just wake up one day and all of a sudden be able to shoot hoops and do layups and all that kind of stuff. It takes practice. And just like anything we commit ourselves to, anything that we want to be good at, we know that that takes intention, time, and effort. And the great thing is, is that when we practice something, if we don't stop learning, listening, we will continue to get better at that particular thing. And so as we continue to invest in in the practice of allyship, it evolves. And it evolves through the various seasons of our life. And within that acknowledgement that we're not going to be pros at being allies overnight is also this beautiful invitation into the practice of curiosity. And curiosity keeps our hearts and our minds engaged with the deepening practice of allyship. So as we discover new and unique ways to personally support the people in our lives, the racialized people in our lives, the people of color that we know, we practice and embody allyship. It's also very helpful If in our institutions and our organizations, if there are distinct, clear policies in place that also protect and elevate and intentionally create space to name and call out those um, inequities that we're noticing. And so it's important that we nurture cultures of equity. You know, it's not just a one-time thing. It's a practice. It's a practice. Allyship is a practice. And ultimately, being okay with not having all the answers or always getting it right is the key. Although each of us have different ways that we can practice this because of uh, how we show up in our lives. For example, even though I'm a person of color, my multiracial identity gives me light skin privilege. So it's my opportunity to learn how I can elevate and dismantle systems of white supremacy so I can practice allyship with my siblings. This is something that like taking time, slowing down and stepping back and looking, okay, like, Sometimes we get frustrated when we try to step up and be allies to people. And we're like, you know, I tried it before and like, I didn't really, I didn't get it right. But it's the truth is, is you're not going to get it right the first time. Like that would just be, that's silly when we think of it in any other area of our lives, right? We just got to practice. And so being okay with uh, making mistakes and trying to show up for somebody and getting it wrong, we need to just be okay. That's part of the journey. And I feel like what we can do with one another to help nurture this culture of, um, you know, practice and dismantling perfectionism is just be generous with one another as we both learn, as we all learn together. So allyship is a practice. Next, allyship is personal. Allyship as personal. I love that. There is no one size fits all solution to embodying the principles of allyship. You know, it really depends on where you're you're coming from, your unique social location, your status, your identity, your experience, your ethnicity, uh, all of that really helps to make up what we call and would define as our social location. And so depending on your social location, it determines your access to power. And our responsibility is to take on, our responsibility will take on different shapes and expressions. It's personal. It's personal. But no one can do it for you. It's your journey, it's your energy, it's your opportunity. And the recognition that allyship is personal 
also is a beautiful reminder that we are invited to bring our full selves into the exchange of allyship, allowing our minds and our bodies and our emotions to engage with the things that we're learning. Because, you know, sometimes when we're we're told that we're wrong in an area or, hey, what you did is actually harmful and it it doesn't it makes me feel small or it doesn't recognize my identity. It doesn't validate my experience. You're putting shame on me that I don't receive. And so when we are calling people out in these ways, um, sometimes, you know, people like can be taken back and like, oh, I'm not a bad person. But I think this is where reminding ourselves that allyship is personal is really important. It's important because we can en- let ourselves engage with our bodies and our emotions and ask, oh, so there's some defensiveness coming up here. W- what What's that telling me? What do I need to learn from this? How can I try to put myself in another person's shoes and see where they're coming from when they say this feedback to me? What does it look like for me to step back and sit with those feelings so that I can show up and support them? This person took the energy and the effort to tell me how my actions made them feel. Okay, let me sit with that. And so it's a personal thing that invites us to engage with it uh, energetically, emotionally, mentally. And that those are all our personal faculties, right? And so allowing this journey to be something that we personally engage with. Allyship is a practice. Allyship is personal. And allyship is practical. Allyship is practical. And I feel like this, like this one, I really, I like to sit with this uh, principle a lot because I'm such a practical person. Like, (laughs) For the first few years of um, dating my now wife, I would always just buy her like practical gifts because that's just how my brain works. I've also learned that there's value in non-practical, but (laughs) when it comes to the practices of allyship, it's really important that um, we look for practical, tangible ways to embody this. Um, Think of it like this. When something's damaged in your house, you know, there's a leak and let's say the toilet sprain, it's in need of repair. And repair means that it requires a little extra energy. It requires a little extra attention. Like normally you're not worrying about the toilet, right? Normally the toilet's functioning how it should function. But when something, when you notice that there is um a system is broken and there's something out of joint, it requires more of our energy and effort. And what allyship does is it recognizes that. Allyship recognizes that disparity and injustice have been disproportionately experienced by racialized communities, by the queer community, by women over history, by immigrants, You know, it recognizes marginalized communities um, and it seeks to invest energy into repairing the damage of oppression. It seeks to invest the extra energy into repairing the damage of oppression. Repair finds ways to intentionally funnel privilege and power into elevating and empowering POC folks, marginalized communities. Allyship looks like something. It looks like something. It's very practical. And so this energy exchange can take on numerous forms, like investing in personal growth through education. So learning about, you know, maybe you're like, yeah, I could I could definitely grow in this area of allyship when it comes to rac- rac- racial equity. Great. I'm so glad that you recognize that. The step one is the fact that you're here, right? We recognize that. That's energy. That's tonight. This is you investing that energy into your personal growth and education. So thank you. Because burdens are built on information. It's easy uh, to get stuck in an echo chamber of experiences, but 
we have the opportunity to actively learn about the experiences, the impacts, the culture, the barriers that different marginalized communities encounter. This will help us. This will help us because burdens are built on information. The more we know, the more we're able to have empathy and compassion and have fresh creative ways and ideas to be able to create creatively address those imbalances in our own families, in our own communities, in our own classrooms. And that's why it's so important that we remember that it's it's a practice that's personal and it looks like something. Your heart will never break for something you didn't know about. So it's so important that we learn about what's happening in our history so that we can understand why people are showing up the way they are, you know? So it's practical. It's investing in your personal growth through education. It's practical. It looks like leveraging resources to restore equilibrium. Equilibrium. So finding ways to build bigger tables, using your voice, your influence, and your connection to bring about change in your world. So it looks like something. Prioritizing relationship building. And this is this is where I love to end this conversation around allyship. Prioritizing relationship building. The most impactful and mutually beneficial way to grow as an ally is in and through relationships. It's in and through relationships, right? Relationships create space for trust, understanding and perspective to organically blossom. Relationships foster rapport, honest exchange and relational equity on the side of both the giver and the receiver. Relationship humanizes the conversation. It's no longer those people. It's Heather. It's Adele. It's your neighbor. In any area you want to grow in your allyship, find community, find people, and bestow value on them through relationship. And I promise you, it will be, it will grow you, it will invite you into a deeper practice of allyship. It will invite you to challenge you to embody the tenets of love to practice kindness, to practice goodness, to practice patience. So those are the three P's of allyship. And I'm just so excited that there's an opportunity for all of us, all of us, each and every single day to live into the tenets of allyship. And the exciting part, the reason why I wanted to break this down for you is that those tenants, these are the tenants that we've woven into the pages of the I Am a Change Maker curriculum. And so we have taken activities and poems and um, stories and crafts, and we have used all of these tools to help teach those principles in easy, accessible, exciting ways for our students. And so that gets me so excited to think about the potential of what we're stepping into. And um, as a form of benediction and blessing, I want to just close out my time with uh, all of you by reading this poem over you. So I, I wrote this poem after I wrote the curriculum. So I, I was sitting with these tenants and I'm building you know, it's it's six uh, different lessons that talk that go deeper and deeper into um, love and power, compassion, celebration, commitment. And as I'm sitting with these tenants, I'm getting excited. Like I can like I'm picturing these things embodied in our communities. I'm starting to let myself daydream and think about the kind of community that we would have when we as a, a body commit to live into these principles, I start to think 
and dream about what our promised land could look like. The potential that we could step into together as we lean into love and equity, as we step up to the calling of being change makers in our own communities. And because I love creating art, I started to write about it. And so I want to close out my time with you by sharing this uh, piece, and it's called Milk and Honey. And it is literally the overflow of my dream of what I'm seeing as we, as a community, commit to live into the principles of allyship. As we slow down and as we value our brother and sister, as we value our sibling, as we look and look with a pure heart and see the face of God in everyone that we interact with. Jesus says in Matthew 5, in the Beatitudes, he says, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Oh, I want to see more of God. I love, I love when I get to see God. It'll change you. It brings celebration. And so I believe that living into the principles of allyship allow us to step into the heart of allyship because at the heart of allyship is celebration. At the heart of allyship is celebration. Celebration is the public declaration of value. It is when we energetically acknowledge that the receiver is worthy of dignity and delight. It sees the experience, the identity, the humanity of the other, and it validates it. Celebration bestows pride. And when we feel proud, pride breeds empowerment. And empowerment is the birthplace of collective liberation. And that's what I was envisioning. That's what I'm dreaming. That's what I'm speaking over you in my benediction as I read the piece called Milk and Honey. And just, it's from my my latest book, Homecoming, a, a collection of uh, my poetic memoir. Let me sing you the story of our milk and honey, where rivers are lush and brimming, it's the song of our collective tomorrow, where our lights are bright and not dimming. It's a tale of inclusion and glory, where all are one and hopes are new. Let me sing you the story of our milk and honey until it becomes your story too. I've seen our promised land. It was exactly as we were told and it was so much more. The rivers teemed with life as truth flowed through them. Her soil was rich with the medicine of loving kindness. Everything living flourished as the light of reciprocity shone throughout the land. But the part I can't stop thinking about, the part that still gives me the most hope, it was seeing the liberated youth who embodied their truth, using their voices and vision for good. It was seeing how power sharing and community caring brought dignity and humanity into every neighborhood. So let me sing you the story of our milk and honey, where rivers are lush and brimming. It's the song of our collective tomorrow, where our lights are bright and not dimming. It's a tale of inclusion and glory, 
where all are one and hopes are new. Let me sing you the story of our milk and honey until it becomes your story too. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me tonight and for just energetically engaging with this conversation. I am so excited about the curriculum. I am so excited that you're, that as a community, um, you're investing in this work of equity, of justice, of the Jedi work. I love that. I love that abbreviation, Jedi work, justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion. <laughs> Growing up with Star Wars, I always like that um, illustration. But thank you again for having me. Thank you for your attention and your time. Let's lean into this work of uh, allyship and equity building together so that we can enjoy the fruits of loving kindness and help usher in our collective promised land. Thank you so much. Bless you. Thank you so much, Heather and Mary, for sharing some of your journey, your passion, your poems, and so much of who you are. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm just going to share a few words in terms of how we might, um, uh, where the curriculum is at at the moment. And of course, in the meantime, please feel free to continue to ask questions in the chat. Um, so you've heard the passion and all that's gone into the development of the of the curriculum, the six session resource. Um, it is uh, currently in the testing phase. So many of us who worked on it are parents or um, people who work with children, um, but we were, we're not children, <laughs> we are adults. And we thought uh, we need to actually engage um, children, the age group who it's designed for. Um, so right now the resource is with um, Sunday schools. There are Sunday schools who are engaging with the curriculum, they're doing the activities um, and they will offer some feedback and <laughs> just let us know what works, what doesn't work, are there things that need to be changed or tweaked? And then we'll roll out the whole curriculum in the new year. Uh, so you can look for the resource in the new year. It will be widely communicated in newsletters, on the website, um, through church X and many other places and spaces. Uh, but certainly in the new year, it will be available. And um, uh, you saw one of the videos or several others that it will also be available uh, on YouTube and that will be all part of the rollout. So more is coming. Um, I would also say the the um, the resource it 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 does a deep dive in terms of race and how do we talk about race and racism with children specifically ages six to twelve. Um, it does start naming that we are uh, you know it, it does offer an intersectional approach in the beginning naming we are many things we have multiple identities racial identity is one of those. Um, and yet sometimes to be able to have the conversation about race, we need to do a deep dive to talk about race. It doesn't mean that other identities are not important. It doesn't mean that um, we're ignoring them, but sometimes to talk about racism, we need to talk about racism, um, particularly because it sometimes feels uncomfortable. Sometimes people want to say, oh, well, that's just like this other thing. So let's talk about this other thing. Um, so this curriculum is really trying to give um, leaders of children um, ideas, resources, theological insights, um, so that they can talk about race with children. So again, it will be available in the new year. In the meantime, um, here is a, there's one resource that is available uh, in 20, 2021. So the 40 days of engagement have been going on for three years now. And the first year in 2021, we developed several children's activities and pull them all together into one resource. Um, so on the main page of the 40 days, if you scroll down to the very bottom, there's a download that says anti-racist children's activities. Uh, and I've put the link here in the chat. Um, so there's some great resources there about um, cultural diversity, about also about race, there's some fun activities. So in the meantime, that's another great resource available. So, <laughs> with that in mind, uh, it's now time to engage with questions and answers with um, Heather and Mary. Uh, so one question that has emerged so far is, um, for both of you or for one of you, um, can you speak a little bit in terms of how you might have advocated for these types of conversations to be happening in schools? Yeah, that's a great question. I feel like it's really important like uh, education is knowledge is power right and so the conversations we're having with our students uh, and like in the school places so are, is so important and 
it starts with just your voice. I would say like, talk to your child's teacher. If your child's in school, write a a letter to the parent council, um, make a meeting with the principal. Like it's, it starts with just advocating and asking for these resources because they exist. Um, there are organizations that will do facilitation work and help support these conversations. And so it just, sometimes we just have to let the administration know that, hey, we want to have these conversations. We want our students to be having them in community together. Great. Thanks for that, Heather. Is there anything you wanted to add, Mary? Uh, in terms of schools, uh, yeah, I think that, no, we have special. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, that's a great question. I'll just add one little bit. Uh, I'm, I'm a parent of two young kids myself, and at, at my um, children's school, we actually started a group called Parents Against Racism, and we mm. kind of organize on the side, and we engage the administration. So a bit of what Heather was talking about, um, and engage other parents in thinking about what are some things that we need to be doing to be advocates for our kids in their educational process. So it's a great idea, and in some places, it's being implemented. Mm. So are there other questions? Um, there's some curiosity about your book, Heather. Wonder if you might talk a little bit about some of your poems or some of the, uh, yeah, some of the impetus behind your poems. Yeah, oh, for sure. Thank you for that. That means a lot. Um, honestly, my poetry and my art is my favorite tool for helping me stay grounded when it comes to these conversations. I think that that's where um, my faith is a big part of that, you know, like, um, this belief in um, the the reality that the light has not the darkness has not overcome the light you know what what uh, John talks about in John chapter one you know and like so my faith roots me my art roots me and so I love to funnel a lot of hope into those pages I like to think of myself as a dreamer um, uh, and so those dreams are often infused with prophetic promises. And I love the medium of spoken word because I believe that there is power in what we're saying about ourselves and what we're saying over our communities and what we're saying about our future and our potential together. And so channeling that energy, like sitting with it and then meticulously picking each word because that's what poetry and art invites us into um, it's my favorite. So I craft these heartfelt prayers and um, all of that. And you can, and then I poured it into um, my book that I was mentioning, Homecoming. It just, I just released it a few back, I guess this November, it's been a year. So it's been a year and all of that is just funneled into the pages here. And it just talks about my journey of uh, uh, confronting, you know, race and uh, homophobia and how Jesus sees me and my journey of what that's been like. Because uh, I used to be a pastor and then I had to come out. And so, you know, how does God feel about the conversations of justice and equity? And how does God feel about me and my identity? And so I've woven that all into the pages of my book. Um, yeah, thank you. Great. Thank you, Heather. So there's another question in the chat, and I can accompany you on this question as well. But um, uh, thanks for being sharing. Thanks for sharing what's being done in terms of the curriculum for ages six to twelve. Uh, so, what strategies are being used or considered um, for engaging teens in this learning? Um, Mary, is there anything you want to talk about in terms of first, third ministries? I can also jump in after you. Uh, for first third ministries, I, I think that it's um, empowering individual. Uh, youth leaders or church uh, leaders in their youth group leadership. And so um, getting these resources and conversations into their hands, having their conversations to then um, create the brave spaces um, and being a part of community and relationship building. And so I think um, from the first third level of uh, working with leaders and offering resources there so that they can then um, work with their youth uh, and be in relationship with their youth. One strategy. That's one strategy. Absolutely. Great. Thanks, Mary. And um, another strategy is that there's some work that's uh, being engaged with Indigenous and racialized youth. Um, there's been some gatherings and 
um, thinking through uh, ways of developing their own leadership. So um, ways of challenging internalized racism, for example, um, and enabling people to be the fullest leaders that they can. Um, so that's another strategy. Um, and there's more that, that can be rolled out, but there's various ways and places um, that uh, teenagers are being engaged uh, in addition to uh, younger children. So, so far there are not um, additional questions in the chat. Um, what, I, what I'll name though is that uh, some of the resources that we've talked about, we will put onto ChurchX. So, um, you know, we can include a link to some of the youth resources that are developed. So the Indigenous um, Racialized Youth Retreat, for example, the, the anti-racist uh, children's activities we'll put there. Um, so it'll be a space where you can find some additional resources as well. Um, but before we uh, close off the evening, um, just wanted to see if Heather and Mary have some um, additional words or closing words uh, before we end the evening. I'm so grateful for this space to, to be able to explore. Grateful for you, Heather, and all of the um, beautiful art that you have shared. Um, and in the journey of um, my journey, it just continues each day. And just to know um, and hold up those three Ps uh, and having that alliteration I didn't have before. So I'll tuck that into my toolbox and, uh, and uh, the journey um, in allyship and anti-racism work and working with um, children and youth is uh, just each day, each day um, and becoming more aware. Um, so I'm really grateful for this time and for you, Adele, and all your work. I'm um, excited to, to keep the journey going. Yeah, I would just echo that. Like, what a blessing to be in this room tonight and to share this space and to nurture these dreams of liberation, of mutual flourishing. Um, I believe that this is exactly the kind of work that Jesus invited us into as um, followers of the way of love, right? Mm -hmm. And so uh, thank you to be, I just, I feel honored to be able to journey alongside all of you in my personal practical practice of allyship. So I just speak a blessing over you as you lean into and grow into being a change maker, because we're all called to be change makers. Thank you so much, Adele, for your leadership and your vision. And thank you, Mary, for your stories. I, I so appreciate it. Thank you, Mary and Heather, once again. Um, just before we close off, Mary, we're wondering if you can just hold up the three resources that you had named earlier, please. I can, definitely. So the first one is God's Holy Darkness. Amazing, beautiful picture book um, by Sherry Green and Becca Selnick. Good Night Racism by Abram X. Kendi. And the one that just landed that I need to spend more time with is The Peace Table. It's a um, a storybook Bible. Thank you, Mary. And thank you, Heather, again. And thank you, everyone, for being here. Thank you, Brian, for doing tech quietly in the background. Uh, thanks, everyone, for your engagement. And we will be in touch uh, about the curriculum when it's finalized and ready to go. Um, and we hope that you might be able to share that with your communities of faith as well. Um, as we close off this evening, once you leave, um, there'll be a small um, survey that will pop up. So we would invite you to spend a couple minutes uh, responding to that survey. Um, and then for those of you who are available, there's no 40 days live session next week on October 31st. The next session will resume on November the 7th. So hope that some of you will rejoin us at that time. Thanks once again for being here and blessings on your evening. Thank you. Bye-bye.